I first learned of H.W. Brand's book, book and his work because I read a book called American Colossus, which is a terrific account of the brawn and the ingenuity and the chicanery at the end of the 19th century that built modern day industrial America. And as good a book as it was, I realized when I bought this book that I wish he'd held on to the title because American Colossus would have been a terrific title for a book about Ronald Reagan. You know the Shakespeare line, man, he doth bestride the world like a colossus. And when you think of political leaders in the 20th century, good or bad, Lenin, Hitler, certainly Reagan up there, Winston Churchill, there are very few but very powerful. Um, Churchill also had the line that also describes Reagan, both to his family and to the people who thought they knew him, the riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. He was to many almost an unknowable man, even to the woman closest to him, Nancy Reagan. Now, we ran into this as a literary problem when the man who was his official biographer, Edmund Morris, had complete access to all the Reagan archives while he was still in the White House, spent hours interviewing Reagan, his confidants, his friends, his family, and still scratched his head over how the story to tell the story and came away writing a kind of fictionalized biographical memoir. This was very frustrating for historians and writers like me because he had this great material, but he still couldn't tell the story because Reagan was so opaque. So now we have H.W. Brands who brings us the story of Reagan in a different form, in a biographical form, in a form that may make us help understand a man who was so powerful and yet so opaque, so unknown, even as I said to himself. So please welcome H.W. Brands. Thank you, Pat, for that kind introduction and actually for that cue because I was going to start with a different, start in a different direction, but since you mentioned Edmund Morris and the alleged enigma of Ronald Reagan. Can you all hear me okay? You doing all right there? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to come to that and I'm going to tell you why I think Reagan is not an enigma. In fact, I'm going to explain Reagan in fairly short order. But before I get to that, I have to tell you a story. And this is a story that Ronald Reagan used to tell on himself. And it relates to the time when Reagan was between careers. He had been a film actor, and his film career had faded to black. He was not yet a political figure. He hadn't figured out that maybe politics was a potential and promising future for him. He was, in fact, working as a pitch man. As I explained to my students, I teach at the University of Texas. So my undergraduates are you know, 19, 20 years old. And I explained that for eight years of his life, he was a walking, talking infomercial. He was a, a pitch man for General Electric. And he used to pitch better living through electricity. He used to pitch the beneficence of GE management to GE employees so they wouldn't want to go off and unionize and demand better wages, higher wages, and better working conditions. He would talk to groups around the country. He, at that time of his life, he refused to fly. He had a great fear of flying. And so he wrote into his contract that he would travel only by train. And as he traveled across the country, he would stop at small towns here and there, and he would speak to rotary clubs and better business bureaus and the Elks and the Chambers of Commerce and all sorts of groups like this. And his face still appeared before the public, not on the film screen, but on the small screen of television. And some of you will be old enough to remember when TV was in its younger days. And it was a real demotion from the big screen of Hollywood to the small screen of those fuzzy little black and white TVs. But nonetheless, he was the host of the GE Theater. That was his, that was what, he, what put him before the public, but what actually made him his money was going around and talking on behalf of General Electric. So, in this story that Reagan used to tell on himself, he is about to speak in a small town somewhere in the Midwest. A lot of Reagan's stories are set in a small town in the Midwest, probably reflecting the fact that Reagan himself was from a small town in the Midwest. But Reagan sensed from that that something about small towns in the Midwest capture what Americans see as the essence of this country. No one's going to tell a story that somehow characterizes the United States and set it in Southern California. And they're not going to set it in New York City or in Miami. They're going to set it in some small town in the Midwest. And in this particular small town, Reagan is about to give a speech. It's a lunchtime speech. And as I say, he is, well, he never was really famous as a film actor. If he had been a better film actor, he never would have gone into politics. But much of the country had essentially forgotten him. 
And it turns out that the MC for this luncheon gig had never heard the name Reagan pronounced. And he was presented with the program for the day, and he was supposed to introduce the speaker. And it said Ronald, R-E-A-G-A-N. And he was a little bit puzzled as to whether the name was pronounced Reagan or Reagan. And plausibly, it could have been either one. And this was a, a considerate guy, and he didn't want to embarrass his guest by mispronouncing his name. That would be thoughtless. And he didn't want to embarrass himself. But he didn't know how he was going to figure out which it was. I tell this story to my students, and nowadays with the internet, you can figure you YouTube, you can find this stuff out really easily. Back in the 19, so this is said in the late 1950s. None of that stuff existed. So this MC is pondering how he's going to resolve the problem, how he's going to figure out what the pronunciation is. And in his dilemma, he takes a walk around the neighborhood in this, where he lives, in this small town. And he's walking along like this, and he's deep in thought. And he bumps into one of his neighbors. Actually, he bumps into the neighbor's dog. The neighbor's walking the dog. And the neighbor knows it, and he says, boy, you know, you look like there's something, a cloud hanging over your head. What's going on? And he explained. And in fact, he pulled the program out of his pocket. And he showed it to him. He says, do you know how to pronounce this guy's name? And the neighbor looks and says, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. He used to be an actor. And uh, his, it, it's Reagan. It's Ronald Reagan. And the MC says, oh, are you sure now? It's Reagan. It's not Reagan. And the guy says, yeah, yeah. Oh, he says, boy, you have really saved me potential embarrassment. And a thanks a lot. I don't know how I can thank you. And he starts walking on, repeating to himself, Reagan, Reagan, Reagan. And he bumps into the dog again. And he says, oh, by the way, that's a really cute dog. What kind is it? A bagel. <laughs> okay, now I want you to, I want you to remember your chocolate because it's going to be important when I get to solving the Reagan enigma. Now, I would say that there are two parts to the Reagan enigma. And one part is what made him tick, and the other part is what made him successful. And I would suggest that they're related, but they're actually separate. And I would say, and getting back to what Pat was saying about Evan Morris, who, I will tell you, as someone who is observing the Morris process from the outside, I had yet to think that I might write about Ronald Reagan. I was teaching high school at the time, and I was teaching about Ronald Reagan, but it never occurred to me that I would write a biography of Ronald Reagan. But I was aware that there was this guy who was hired as the official historian of the Reagan presidency and was at work, and had this kind of privileged access to Reagan that no historian or biographer has ever had with regard to another sitting president. So this was unprecedented. And then, you know, then, as, as Pat says, uh, the book was delayed and delayed and delayed, and when it finally came out, it was this fictionalized version. And when Edmund Morris was explaining why he took the approach that he did, he said, as much time as I spent with Reagan, the, the essence of Reagan just escaped me. I don't think that's exactly right. I mean, or I should not cast aspersions on the sincerity of Edmund Morris, but I will say this. I know because I've heard him say it that Edmund Morris finds politics boring. Now, Edmund Morris's previous book, the one the strength, on the strength of which he got the job writing about Ronald Reagan, was biography of the young Theodore Roosevelt. And this was Theodore Roosevelt until he is just about to become president. Now, maybe Morris thought that this was what political figures in the United States are like, like the young Theodore Roosevelt, who was intrinsically interesting. And if Theodore Roosevelt had never been president of the United States, lots of people would have written his biography. As I say, Morris's best-selling Pulitzer Prize-winning biography of Roosevelt stopped before Roosevelt went into politics. And Morris comes to Reagan and discovers that Reagan is no Theodore Roosevelt. And if Reagan had not been president of the United States, neither Morris nor I nor anybody else would have written about Ronald Reagan. The importance of Ronald Reagan is precisely his role in politics. And if you find politics boring, then you're probably going to find Reagan boring. Anyway, so 
There are two questions about, I'll call it the, the Reagan enigma. One is what made him tick, and the other is what made him successful. As to what made Reagan tick, I'm going to share with you uh, something that happened to me when I was actually doing research for the Reagan book. And I was working on the Reagan book while I was doing a book tour for a previous book. And it was when I, I, was, um, I was doing an interview with a radio uh, show host. And we were talking about the previous book, his book on Ulysses Grant. And so we come to the end of the, the interview, and he asked the question that always comes up at the end of the interview, so what's your next project? Who are you writing on? And I said, I'm writing on Ronald Reagan. And at that point, he put his hand over the microphone. See, I got two of them. I put his hand over the microphone, and he said, when we get off the air, there's something I want to tell you. OK, so I thought, well, you know, maybe, and this was in the Midwest. It was in Chicago. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe he has some Reagan letters. Maybe his uh, great aunt dated Reagan. You know, maybe there's some new stuff here that nobody's heard of. So we get off the air, and I'm all ears. And he says, if you want to understand Ronald Reagan, you need to keep one thing always in mind. I said, yes. He said, you need to remember that Ronald Reagan was the son of an alcoholic father. Now, I heard him say that, and I was trying to decide how to respond. I didn't know if he thought he was giving me new information, of which I wasn't aware. And I didn't know if he knew that in both of Reagan's memoirs, Reagan says quite clearly that his father was an alcoholic. So at a loss for words, I did what anybody would do when you're at a loss for words, just keep quiet and see what he says next. And he said, I speak as the son of an alcoholic father. And he said, when you grow up in that circumstance, when the person on whom you want to model yourself, the person whom you are looking to for emotional support, for security, the person who's supposed to be your pillar of strength, when that person is one who one day is your best friend, and you're tossing the ball around in the backyard, and he takes you out for ice cream, and he tells you funny stories, and he, he, you think he's the best guy in the world. And the next day, he's beating the living daylights out of you. When you grow up in that circumstance, you build this emotional wall around yourself because you just can't risk it time after time after time. And I thought about this, and I wasn't going to take it entirely on his word, but I thought, OK, as I go back through the materials that I've been looking at, I will keep my eye out for signs of this. So I was looking back at stuff, and there were two indications that maybe he was on to something. One was something that Nancy Reagan said, and Pat alluded to this. Uh, Nancy Reagan wrote a memoir of her own, as an aside. When I was working on the Reagan book, I was the beneficiary of the fact that people around Reagan, and especially in the Reagan administration, cordially loathed one another. And as soon as they got out of the administration, they wrote their stories dishing it all on one another. And this is exactly what you want if you're the biographer. You want dysfunctional groupings. You know, Tolstoy said that every happy family is alike. They're all boring. It's the unhappy ones. The same thing applies to presidential administrations and presidential biographies. You want the ones that are unhappy. So Nancy Reagan wrote a memoir. And, and how many of you have read, any of you read Nancy Reagan's memoir? Well, you really should, because it is one of, and I should say, don't bother reading presidents' memoirs. President's memoirs are really, they are boring, because they're a recital of everything you already heard. And there's only one memoir by a former president that any of you should bother reading. You know which one it is? And it's a, if you were paying close attention, you'll notice that I didn't call it a presidential memoir. I said a memoir by a former president. Somebody said, Ulysses Grant. Yes. And one of the reasons it's so good is it's not about his presidency. Anyway, it's about the Civil War. 
Anyway, so Nancy Reagan writes this very candid memoir in which she is revealing of herself and of Ronnie, as she always called him. Um, Nancy Reagan always called Reagan Ronnie. In her memoir, you know, to his face, to friends, it was Ronnie. Do any of you know what Ronald Reagan called Nancy? Mommy. When I say that, I try to get the reaction of various people. So what does that mean? And I, I got a little bit of, from this group of, uh, I tell you, when I say this to my undergraduates, it's a universal, Ugh. Anyway. So Nancy Reagan says that she knew Ronnie better than anyone else, which is quite true. In fact, the relationship between Nancy and Ronald Reagan is, was, one of the really touching love stories of modern American public life. They were utterly devoted to each other. I would say they were sort of exclusively devoted to each other. Everybody else was on the outside, including the children who had a tough time. But Nancy Reagan says in this memoir, I was closer to him, I knew him better than anyone else. But even with me, there were these moments when the curtain came down and I didn't know what was going through his head, I didn't know what was going through his heart. And I just had to wait. There was always even that distance between the two of us. So what the radio host had said seemed to ring true with this. There's another bit of evidence. This comes from Reagan himself in one of his memoirs. And Reagan describes a moment when he's 11 years old living in Dixon, Illinois. And he's coming home late one evening from the local YMCA. And it's in the middle of winter. It's freezing cold. There's snow on the ground. He turns into the walkway going to the family house. And he sees his father passed out drunk on the ground in the snow. And as Reagan is telling this story, 70 years later, he's reliving the moment. And he says that I stood there for a second and I asked myself, should I just keep walking and go inside and leave him there? Now, he didn't say in the memoir what the obvious conclusion of this was, basically, and let him freeze to death in the snow. And in the next sentence, he says, well, I decided I'd have to pick him up and drag him in. But if just for that moment, and by his own recollection, he thought about it, for this 11-year-old kid to think, you know, my life might be better if my father were dead. You know, that is quite a weight to carry. Okay, so what made Ronald Reagan a tip? Well, it was partly this. He, he did build this shield around himself. There was something else that made Reagan tick, and it was something that he discovered, I would say, maybe by accident, or at least it was by the actions of his mother. His father was utterly unreliable. His mother was the one on whom he and his brother depended. And I think this is why he called Nancy mommy, because Nancy became a substitute for his mother. At a very early age, that is a very early age for Reagan, his mother, Nell, took him along to the church that she attended, and she sort of, as the equivalent of child care, and she was, she used to put on, she used to put on plays and skits and little musicals. And he was a cute kid. He was, in fact, the Edmund Moore's book is called Dutch, because that was his nickname when he was young, because the family didn't have any money and his mom would just put the bowl on top of the head and you know, trim the hair around it for the Dutch boy haircut. So he gets up on stage, first time. And again, this is something that he remembers from 75 years after the fact. He's about five years the first time he gets on stage. And he remembers vaguely that he always felt uncertain at home in his life 
Life was insecure. It was unhappy. He was not adept socially. He was clumsy. He wanted to be a good athlete. His brother was the better athlete. His brother, brother was the one who had more friends. He was the awkward one. He was terribly nearsighted. And life was just kind of a struggle and a chore until he got on stage. And in that memoir, in fact, in both, he wrote two memoirs, one when he was going into politics, the other one when he was going out of politics. And in that memoir, he uses the phrase, I remember the music of that applause. When he realized that when he was on stage, people liked him. He could make them laugh. He could make them clap. He could get their attention. All of a sudden, life became better. So, if you want to understand what made Reagan tick, I'm not going to claim to have the answer to all of the mysteries of Ronald Reagan. No one has the answer to all the mysteries of anyone. But if you just look at the course of his life, it's a search for one stage, one audience after another. So, from the stage of the local church, he joined the drama club in high school. He was an actor in college. It was when he was in high school, confirmed when he was in college, that he decided he wanted to go to Hollywood because he used to watch the movies and he could imagine what it would be like to be a star. He didn't, he didn't immediately go from Eureka College to Hollywood because he thought that was too big a jump. So he took an interim step and he went into radio. And he figured, okay, you know, there are only a very limited number of movie stars, but there are lots of radio announcers. So he went into radio, but radio was showbiz. Radio had an audience. Radio discovered that Reagan had a really good voice. And one other thing, radio was the medium that captured Reagan's political imagination. This was at a moment when radio was the broadcast, the only broadcast medium, and the medium that was dominated by Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I'm going to guess that none of you are old enough to remember any of the Roosevelt fireside chats. And if you do, you don't have to admit it. Maybe you can proudly admit it. But Reagan listened to those, and Reagan was swept away by what this man sitting in the White House could do by way of connecting with the American people. Now, these days, you can hear all of, Reagan, of Roosevelt's fireside chats on the internet. And so I play these for my students, and I turn down the lights in the room, and I try to get them to imagine that they are at home in the middle of winter, and it's dark, and it's cold, and it's the middle of the Great Depression. And here's this voice that comes almost out of well, in fact, when I, I, I was talking to an audience much like this, and I said that, you know, when people would hear this voice, and it would sound like it was their father putting them to bed, because the fireside chats always occurred on Sunday evenings, and they aired at 10 o'clock Eastern time, so 7 o'clock on the West Coast. So a lot of people actually were in bed, and especially during the Depression when it was cold to save on fuel, you'd pull up under the covers. And essentially, Franklin Roosevelt would tuck them into bed. And, they, and what he said in one form or another was, everything's going to be OK. So I said this. And I said that a generation of Americans grew up thinking that Franklin Roosevelt's voice was the voice of their favorite uncle or their father or somebody like that. And a woman came up to me after one of these talks and said, I heard those fireside chats. And the voice I heard was not the voice of my favorite uncle, the voice I heard was the voice of God. Anyway, so this is what Reagan listens to. He goes off to Hollywood, and he has a moderately successful career, but he never cracked the top line on the marquee. Now, he imagined that it was mostly a matter of bad timing. He thought his breakthrough role in King's Row had come, well, it did come, just as the U.S. was going to World War II. And so the, the studios stopped making so many films. He made films for the Army and said by the time he came back, the audience had passed him by. That was not the real issue. The reason that Reagan was not an A-list actor was 
It was that emotional wall he built around himself. Because I've never been an actor, so I don't speak from personal experience here, and some of you perhaps know this much better than I, but it certainly seems to me that in order to convey an emotion on screen, you have to have some place in yourself where you feel that emotion, and you're willing to go there. And Reagan simply wasn't willing to go there. Reagan was, he played, well, when Reagan decided to go into politics, Samuel Goldwyn of Metro Goldwyn Mayer heard that Reagan was running for governor of California. And he said, no, 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 Jimmy Stewart for governor, Reagan for best friend. And, and that was the way he was viewed. Anyway, so as I told you, his film career faded. Oh, but while he was in the movies, and while he was no longer getting good roles, he discovered the politics of the film industry. And it was his first taste of politics, the first taste of the give and take of negotiations with the studios, of trying to thread the needle between, well, radical labor unions in Hollywood in the late 1940s, and conservative audiences, and the rising conservative right in the Republican Party represented by Joseph McCarthy. And Reagan discovered that he liked this. Now, he didn't, and there's no indication that at that point, he thought, well, one day I'm going to run for elective office myself. He still fantasized that his movie career would somehow revive. It didn't. Anyway, so Reagan goes to work for GE, and that gig finally gave out when the ratings for the GE theater went down, and it found a new competitor on Sunday nights, Bonanza. And it turns out that Lauren Green was a better leading man than Reagan, even on television. So Reagan is faced with this, well, you could call it a career crisis. He was 52 years old, and he, he couldn't go back to the movies, and he had an even lesser gig as host of Death Valley Days. And you know, so his future doing what he was doing was quite limited. He didn't know what the next thing would be. Well, he started, he sort of rediscovered his interest in politics. And around LA and Southern California, he began speaking on behalf of political candidates. Now, this was in the very early days of television, and TV didn't know quite how to handle politics. So most of speaking on behalf of candidates was still at the way it was done back in the 19th century, where there would be proxies. So somebody would give a speech on behalf of Richard Nixon, for example, in 1960. This is, Reagan, I should add, was a Democrat. He was still a Democrat. He was so enamored of Franklin Roosevelt back in the 1930s that he was a Democrat. And he remained a Democrat through the 50s until the early 1960s. And Nixon, in fact, encouraged Reagan to remain a Democrat while campaigning for Nixon. Because Nixon liked the idea of Democrats for Nixon. Anyway, so Reagan is giving these speeches, political speeches on behalf of candidates. And in 1964, the Republicans nominate Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater, turns out, had a political philosophy identical to Ronald Reagan's. By this time, Reagan had gone 180 degrees from the admiration for Franklin Roosevelt's policies to a conservative view, just the opposite of Roosevelt and the New Deal. Now I would add that Reagan remained quite enamored of Franklin Roosevelt as a model for how to be president, even though the policies were different. So people who heard Reagan give these speeches said, this guy gives a pretty good speech. And they looked at the state of the Goldwater campaign. This is now, there are just 10 days left in the, the campaign of 1964. Goldwater is conservative. And the conservatives in the country in 1964 were no more than about 35% of the general electorate. And it was very clear that Goldwater was going to be buried in the general election. The incumbent Lyndon Johnson was going to thunder to a huge victory. And the Goldwater campaign think, well, there's nothing to lose. We can try something new. We probably won't be able to salvage the election, but we might actually diminish the debt we're going to have when the election's over. So they agree to allow Reagan, who has, has had some friends in Southern California, think, OK, we'll put up some money to rent uh, a hall, and we will hire an audience 
and they will come and he'll pretend to give a speech. I mean, they'll pretend to be a political audience and he'll give this speech and we'll record it and then we'll play it around the country. So they did. And the speech was aired in the last week of October 1964. And it's fair to say that five minutes before that speech was aired, almost no one in the country outside of Southern California had any idea that Ronald Reagan had anything to do with politics. Most of the country could not remember who Ronald Reagan was. But the idea that he had some kind of political knowledge, anything to say, this was foreign to nearly the whole country. That's five minutes before the speech. Five minutes after the speech, there were Reagan for president committees <laughs> being formed in various states. Now, how did he do it? If you, you I'm sure you've had no occasion to do this, but the, the folks in kind of the people who like Ronald Reagan speak of this speech as it's the speech. If you go home and get on the computer, if you Google Reagan the speech, it immediately pops up. And it's on YouTube. And it's great because it's, well, so here's this guy standing behind a podium like this. And he's giving this speech to an audience like you, except you've all been paid to be there. <laughs> and you have been instructed. And you've got your cues. And the cue is, when this guy mentions the candidate, Barry Goldwater, then you clap. And they all had Goldwater signs, and, and the Goldwater signs are going to come up. And they had two cameras. They had one camera back there, trained on the speaker, and they had another camera over here that could look out on the audience. And Reagan starts to give his speech. As I say, no one had any idea that he knew anything about politics. It turns out when he was working for General Electric, that he was sort of developing his ideas on politics. So he had this speech, actually, what he had was a distillation of speeches he'd been giving for the previous several years. And he tried to cram them all into 28 minutes. And you could tell that he was pressed for time because in the first part of the speech, he's talking really fast. And he's talking too fast. And the people are listening, they're not quite sure what to make of this. And they're waiting for their cue. They're waiting for the word Goldwater. But he talks, and he talks, and he talks. And he doesn't mention Goldwater. And the camera over on the side is panning out on the audience. And these people are just sitting on their signs. What do we do? And there, he's halfway into this 30-minute speech when they catch on. Wait a minute. This isn't about Goldwater. This is about Ronald Reagan. And they warm up to this, and as they warm up, Reagan warms up as well. Although he'd been a film actor, he really hadn't given speeches except to live audiences. And the audience at this point had been dead, but now it's starting to liven up. And it's very interesting, because you can see this on YouTube, and you can see the connection that he makes. And it's an astonishing thing. By the end of the speech, there are, and so it's aired around the country, and by the end of the speech, there are Republicans all over the country who are saying, oh my gosh, we nominated the wrong guy. If we had nominated this guy, we might have a chance. And Democrats around the country are saying, uh-oh, we better watch out for that guy. So this starts Reagan's political career. Now, I told you that I was going to solve the enigma of what made Reagan tick. Now I'm going to tell you about the enigma of what made Reagan successful. Well, and this is, I guess, to the political biographer, almost more to the point. Now. I will say that Reagan was successful in the following way. Reagan changed the political conversation in the United States. From the 1930s to the 1970s, the tendency in American politics was toward bigger government. It was an age of liberalism. You could call it the age of Franklin Roosevelt, where the idea was that if there is an important problem facing Americans, government can be the solution to that problem. To put it very simply, in the terms of modern American politics, if you think that government is the solution, you're a liberal. If you think that government is the problem, you're a conservative. I oversimplify, but that's the first cut when we're talking about views toward politics. Now, Reagan had originally been one who thought that government was 
the solution. But by, the by 1980, Reagan has concluded that government is the problem. And in fact, so had the American people. I mean, how do I know this? Well, you can look at public opinion polls, but the most important opinion polls were the ones that happened on the 1st November of every fourth year. And in 1936, 1936, this was when Franklin Roosevelt ran for re-election. And he was elected by the largest popular margin in American history. He got 61% of the vote. And that was as strong an endorsement of liberalism, of the idea that government is the solution, as you could imagine. When Reagan was, when Reagan runs for re-election, in 1984, he is re-elected by a comparable bombardment. He gets almost 60% of the vote. But it's just the opposite thing that people are voting for. Because Reagan is the one who announced in his inaugural address in 1981 that government is not the solution. Government is the problem. And I would suggest that if the period from the 1930s to about 1980 was the age of Roosevelt, the age of liberalism, that the, age, the period from 1980 to even now is the age of Reagan. In that, if you poll Americans today and ask them, do you think government is a force for good? Do you think government is the solution? No, many more of them would say government is the problem. Now, this is not to say that government has shrunk appreciably since Reagan was president. Government is really sticky, and it tends not to shrink. But the number of what shall I say, new proposed government solutions to problems, which came along by the dozens and the scores during the era of Franklin Roosevelt, they come along seldom, and they're greatly resisted. The Affordable Care Act is the best example. It was passed in 2010, and it's still struggling to maintain its grip on life. Anyway, so Reagan was a success in that regard. Reagan was also an even greater success in foreign policy. In fact, Reagan had two political goals through his entire career. One was shrink government at home. Number two was defeat communism abroad. Now, Reagan didn't succeed in shrinking government at home, but he did slow the rate of his growth. In terms of defeating communism abroad, a definitive success. So, Reagan's successful. The question is, how did he do it? And this is harder to explain than it sounds, because, well, I will say, having studied presidents, and other sort of great figures in history, there's this tendency to think that individuals who have a great effect on the world are the kind of people that you can identify from a distance. So, you know, if you look at Alexander the Great, or Napoleon, or, you know, um, Lyndon Johnson, I mean, to take an American context, Lyndon Johnson was one whose ambition, whose talent, whose drive was observable from a distance. People who knew Lyndon Johnson when he was 18 said, this guy is going places. He was really smart. He was really ambitious. He would do what was necessary to get what he wanted. Ronald Reagan did not have that kind of obvious ambition. He did not have those obviously lofty goals. And I will say this, that, and I, I don't know how to say this without sounding dismissive of Reagan, but I'll just go ahead and say it, and you'll make it what you will. <laughs> Reagan was almost never the smartest guy in the room. Okay? And, but one of the secrets of Reagan's success, I'm going to explain to you, you know, the enigma of Reagan's success. Well, one of the secrets of his success was knowing that intelligence is overrated in politics. <laughs> Now, again, I mean, you sort of laugh and chuckle, but hey, I mean that quite specifically, and I'll tell you how I mean it. What Reagan discovered was, and I'm sure a lot of you have had this experience in other walks of life, that in any particular endeavor, you have to be smart enough. And there's sort of a threshold for whatever it might be, and for certain things, you have to be smarter than for other things. If you're going to go into theoretical physics, you know, the intellectual bar is up here. If you could go into something else, it's, you know, lower than that. So, but Reagan understood that political leadership is not about being the smartest guy in the room. Actually, I will tell you. So I did a bunch of interviews for the, the book, and I talked to everybody, every surviving member of his cabinet, and pretty much every senior person who worked with him. And I wanted to know what they made of this guy. And I wasn't going to ask this question, but I didn't have to, because they answered it unprompted. And what they all said within probably the first two or three minutes 
And it was almost in the identical wording. And they said, you know, Ronald Reagan was smarter than people gave him credit for being. <laughs> now, this is one where, is this a backhanded compliment? You know, what do you make of this? Because Reagan wasn't given credit for being smart at all. Clark Clifford called him an amiable dunce. Now, Clifford was a Democrat who didn't like his policies, but this idea that Reagan was this empty-headed actor was fairly common. And so to say he's smarter than that is not exactly the highest possible praise. But, and then so I waited to hear, so what they were going to say next, or at least imply next, as in, and he needed people like me to accomplish what he did. But I never got a word of that. And in fact, the most striking thing that I got from these interviews was the great respect and admiration that all these people had for Reagan. And these were people who were extremely accomplished, people who had worked with the highest powered folks in the world. And they thought that Reagan had something that other people didn't have. And this was the secret of success. What did he have? Well, the reason I told you that joke at the beginning was that Ronald Reagan used to tell jokes. In fact, if you go back and look, and I, I, I won't say that I've, yeah, I've read pretty much every speech that Reagan gave, they almost all begin with a joke. And so I ask myself, what's going on here? What's the strategy? Well, part of it is the, the lunchtime speaker who likes to warm up the crowd. But there was something else that Reagan understood, the power of humor. He understood that when you walk into a skeptical room, to an audience that's inclined to be hostile, if you can make them laugh, and it can be just a silly little thing like this bagel beagle thing, and if you can get them to laugh, then all of a sudden their defenses start to go down. And they realize, gee, this isn't such a bad guy. Reagan made more effective use of humor than any president in American history. Now, some of you will say, wait, what about Abraham Lincoln? Well, Reagan's jokes are a lot better than Lincoln's jokes. <laughs> Lincoln's jokes are groaners. You don't laugh at them, you groan. And members of Lincoln's cabinet, they groan too. Actually, there's a difference as well. You know, Lincoln almost never spoke in public. He never told these jokes in public because in the 19th century, presidents didn't speak in public. You know why Lincoln is remembered for three addresses? His first inaugural address, the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural address. So those are the only three he ever gave. <laughs> because presidents didn't bother to speak when you couldn't broadcast their words. Even the State of the Union address. It wasn't an address, it was a written message. So one secret of Reagan's success was his sense of humor. A second one was knowing that being smart enough is good enough. That beyond that, in fact, intelligence can be a hindrance. Jimmy Carter, I have no way of knowing what Jimmy Carter's IQ is. I don't know what Ronald Reagan's IQ is, but I would be willing to bet that Jimmy Carter's IQ is substantially higher than Ronald Reagan's. And Ronald Reagan was by far the better president, partly because Carter, being so smart, was tempted to try to master everything. Reagan was not tempted. Reagan knew that another secret of success is focus. Even the president of the United States, the most powerful person in the world, cannot do everything. But if he focuses on a couple of things, then he can make progress. And so Reagan focused again and again on trying to shrink government at home, defeating communism abroad. Now, Reagan also understood, and well, this is, I'm going to uh, end my comments here because I want to leave a little time for questions. Um, Reagan understood, in addition to the humor, in addition to the, the ability to focus, Reagan understood what, American, what the American people respond to. And what they respond to is someone who has a vision. Someone who has a vision for an American future. Someone who is optimistic about the future. Reagan, Reagan's political philosophy was conservative. And I don't know how many of you consider yourselves conservative, how many of you consider yourselves other. But one of the striking features of American conservatism, and in fact, it's coming out very clearly in this election campaign, is that American conservatives, like conservatives generally, tend to be pessimists. And the reason that conservatives are pessimists, the reason you're conservative, is you think that change is usually for the worse. And so you want to hang on to what you got. That's what makes you a conservative. Reagan was that rare American conservative who was an optimist. Reagan believed that America's best 
days were ahead. And he said this with great confidence. Even you, some of you, or most of you, will remember the 1970s. And it was a very unsettling time. Reagan also had recalled back in the 1930s when what Franklin Roosevelt had to tell the American people was not that I've fixed the economy and that everything's going to be better tomorrow. What Franklin Roosevelt said in his first inaugural address was that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, which was quite wrong. The American people had lots to fear in 1933. But <laughs> Roosevelt made them believe that there was a better day ahead. And Reagan made Americans believe that there was a better day ahead. So I'm going to stop on that note and just, just observe one last thing. I'll set the applause and stop right there. Yeah. I think we have time for one or a few questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to hear your comments about the tip between George Will and Bill O'Reilly. Okay, the question is the tip between George Will and Bill O'Reilly. And this uh, comes from O'Reilly's book on killing Reagan. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out why O'Reilly insisted on shoehorning Reagan into his killing Lincoln, killing Kennedy, killing Jesus series. Because O'Reilly would have sold lots of books on Ronald Reagan if he didn't call it killing Reagan. But he has to kind of make this argument, so it fits the, the series, that the near-death experience that Reagan had when he was almost assassinated in March 1981 had this lingering effect that triggered his Alzheimer's disease and eventually led to his death. Well, first of all, there's no evidence whatsoever that it triggered Alzheimer's. And if an injury suffered in 1981 leads to a death in 2004, and when the person shot in 1980 was already 70 years old, I'm going to say that's the kind of lethality we could all hope for. Um, I would just say that the book is very tangentious and based on very little evidence. I'm with Will on this camp. Uh, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. In response to that, I will say, if any of you find yourself in Austin, my classroom door is open. And I do have people just kind of walking in off the street. Yes. The assertion is that there is a common thread among many presidents in having an absent or unreliable father, and they have to rely on a very strong mother. And is there something that we can extrapolate from this? And I would say, yeah, there probably is. There are various roads to the White House, and there's no single path, and various people come by various means. But I would say this, that if you think about what politics represents, at bottom, politics is a popularity contest. And you know, with Bill Clinton, it seems to me quite obvious. With Reagan, it was a little bit more subtle. But basically, if people vote for you, Bill Clinton was elected governor of Arkansas, what, eight times? You know? And with every time you get elected, then it assuages that insecurity. And it's, once again, people like me. They love me. And with Reagan, as I say, it's a little bit more subtle, but it is this business of putting yourself on stage. And I mentioned, I'm going to end in just a moment, Franklin Roosevelt, when he in the 1930s, pulled Orson Welles, the famous actor and director, aside and said, you know, Orson, you and I are the two finest actors in America. <laughs> and of course, Reagan was professionally an actor. I, I would spin it slightly differently. I would say that Roosevelt and Reagan and other successful presidents are performers. And, and you know, an actor implies that somebody else wrote your lines. In fact, Reagan wrote more of his own lines than any president since Woodrow Wilson. 
who wrote all of his own speeches on his own typewriter. But to perform the presidency, successful presidents understand that they are the figure that all Americans look to for leadership, for vision, for consolation in times of national distress. And they have to perform that office. They, it's almost like being a priest or a shaman. And if you can fulfill that role, then you have a chance to be successful. Some presidents don't have a clue. Jimmy Carter knew nothing about this, and if somebody had told him, he would have said that's beside the point. That's not part of the job description. No, it's not in the Constitution. But it is in popular expectations of presidents. And those presidents who can convey a vision, those presidents who can make Americans believe that there is a better day ahead. And just on a last note, I'm looking for that candidate this go-round. Thank you very much.